Just as the moon disperses the darkness of the night by its light, giving confidence and safety to nighttime travelers, the light of the teachings of the Lord Buddha offer safety to all those who must navigate the cycle of existence towards perfection in life. On the full moon day of each month, Buddhists throughout the world reflect upon the great compassion of the Lord's Buddha in discovering and teaching Tama for the benefit of all beings. However, about 500 years after the final passing away of the Lord's Buddha, although the theoretical teachings of the Lord's Buddha were compiled and preserved in the Buddhist scriptures, but the practical teachings which allowed others to become enlightened in his footsteps disappeared from the world. It was only 2,000 years later that a great monk was to sacrifice his life for Buddhism in order to rediscover this missing core of the practical teachings once known to the Lord Buddha. It was on the full moon day of the September 1914 that a Buddhist monk named Pratmungkon Tepunni Sotjantasaro made the determined vow to meditate to the death if he could not rediscover some small part of the original teachings the Lord's Buddha brought to the world. Whatever, Whatever happens, happens, if I cannot I attain, attain even a small part of the truth, truth which, which the Lord, Lord Buddha knew, I will, I will sit, sit to death. death. If, if I, I die, die my, my actions, actions will be a model of goodness for monks and, and Buddhists of later generations. generations. This, this will be my virtue, virtue if, if I, I should die. die. It was only after striving with the utmost resolve to the degree he was prepared to lay down his life, that he was able to attain the Tamakaya, a rediscovery of unrivaled significance for all in quest of enlightenment through meditation, and notable in that his discovery was a precedent never before touched upon by his contemporary masters of meditation or in manuals of practice, a path of practice revealed by cultivating the minds along the middle way, the path to an end of all sufferings. Prat Mungkon Tep Muni was born Sot Mekau Noi on the 10th of October 1885 in Song Pinong, Supanburi, Thailand. His family home overlooked the village temple from the opposite bank of the river. His father was called Ngun Me Gao Noi and his mother Sut Jai. He was the second born of five children. His family was in the rice trading business and they shipped rice by barge in Song Pinong and the adjoining districts. He showed intellect, determination, and steadfastness of character from an early age, never resting from any tasks he had set his mind to until achieving success. He helped his parents from an early age. It was only at the age of nine that he had the chance to commence his formal education when his uncle became a monk at Song Pinong Temple. Later, he continued his studies at Wat Bangla Banglain Nakhon Batom until being fully versed in Thai and Kong languages.
Only then did he return to help his parents with the family business. In his teenage years, the family relied upon him for most of their business affairs and trading voyages to the neighboring towns. At the age of 14, his father passed away, leaving him in charge of business and family alike. He was able to keep all the work well in hand, despite his tender years, and was well accepted by his crews because of his sincerity, wisdom, and compassion. Business prospered year by year until his family gained a reputation for its financial standings. One day, returning upstream to Song Pinong, the barge empty, but carrying the cash from the rice sale, he encountered dangerous rapids near Nakhon Chai Si. To avoid difficulty in making headway, he took a shortcut through a narrow, pirate-infested creek called Bang Itan. Usually barges would only risk that route in convoys, but that day he found himself alone. Sensing foreboding, he had his crew man the helm, knowing all too well that pirates would attack the helmsman first, thinking him to be the owner. He availed himself of an eight-shot rifle and hid in the bow. However, on further consideration, he felt ashamed of himself, letting others risk their lives in his place, thinking compassionately of his crew. All the crew gets from me for looking after this wretch barge is 10 or 11 baht a month. Why should I let them be the first to die when I'm the one who owns it? If disaster strikes, they should look after their own skins because they have wives and children dependent on them for the rice in their bellies. That day he was to escape danger, unscathed, but the crisis brought home to him the fertility of the household life. He vowed to himself that he would renounce the world life and become a monk as soon as he could guarantee the security of his family for the rest of their lives in his absence. At the time he made his vows, he was barely 19. However, he didn't take his own ambitions lightly. He took three years to amass sufficient wealth to support his family, only then entering the monastery for lifelong ordination. Lung Pa Wat Bak Nam took ordination at Song Pi Nong Temple and was given the monastic name of Jantasaro Piku. He remained only one rainy season at that temple before traveling to Bangkok to further his studies at Wat Chetupon in both scriptural and meditational subjects. He was outstandingly conscientious in his study of the scriptures from renowned teachers, traveling regularly to Wat Arun on the opposite banks of the Chaupaya River, Wat Mahatat, Wat Sutat and Watsam Bloom in search of knowledge. He even sought extra scriptural knowledge by spending time in temples such as Wat Mahatat, Supanburi, and returned periodically to his home temple at Song Pinong. From the earliest days of his ordination onwards, Lung Pa Wat Bak Nam devoted the best part of his time to training himself in meditation. He meditated daily, without exception, and roamed from temple to temple in quest of knowledge concerning the proper way to meditate. In his eleventh year, as a monk, he found himself at Bot Bon Temple, Bangku Wieng Non Taburi. In the middle of his rainy season, he reflected on the vocation to ordain he had had in his heart since the age of nineteen. He realized that although he was now in his twelfth reigns, he still had not attained direct experience of any small part of Buddha's enlightenment. 
he thus felt inspired to strive to the utmost on the full moon day of September 1914. When he returned from alms round that morning, he organized things to minimize any remaining worries in his mind and made his way to the main chapel to sit for meditation. He made up his mind that if he were not to hear the sound of the midday drums, he would no more move from his meditation mat. He meditated using the mantra, Samma Arahang, until he started to experience extreme pain throughout his body. He endured the pain by virtue of the vow he had made and eventually managed to transcend the pain. His mind became more serene until it came to a standstill, at a single point at his diaphragm appearing as a bright sphere, the size of a yolk of an egg, steadfast and joyous at his center. The same evening, having completed his various duties, he returned to the main chapel a second time for meditation and again vowed, O oh Lord, impart to me the tamma which you attain on the day of your enlightenment. If my enlightenment will be of virtue and benefit to Buddhism, then please, O oh Lord, transport me to the greatest tamma. I shall be thy champion to maintain and uphold the greatness of thy teachings. But should my enlightenment be in vain of no benefit to thy teachings, then, Lord, I will sacrifice my life in this meditation as the only offering I have for thee. The bright clear sphere from earlier that day was still firmly established at the center of his body and now became brighter and clearer at his center. It expanded and became as bright as the midday sun. The sound of the ancient words, Matima, Patipata, or the middle way, were mysteriously to be heard at the center of his body. He was able to see a bright spot at the center of his body, and he expanded the sphere, enlarged, and disappeared. He whispered to himself, Ah, it's, it's so, so hard, hard like, like this. This, this is, is why, why no one else, else could manage to achieve it. Sensation, sensation memory, memory, thought, and, and cognition, cognition, all, all these, these things, things must be united, united into, into one, one single spot. spot. Once, Once the, the mind, mind is filled, filled it, it ceases, ceases to, to be. be. Once, Once it, it ceases, ceases to be, the new one can, can arise. arise. Stopping his mind continuously, he was able to attain Tamakaya, or body of enlightenment, a body which had an appearance similar to Buddha image with the lotus bud as its top knot, but completely clean and pure like crystal. Lung Pa Wat Bat Nam revised and further refined his inner experience until at the end of his meditation. The vision of the temple appeared to him, which he recognized as Wat Bang Pla, where he had studied in his youth, and it occurred to him that this must be the place where he must start to spread the Tamakaya tradition. At the end of the rainy season, Lung Pa Wat Bak Nam transferred to Wat Bang Pla to teach the monks residence there. He was able to train three monks and four lay people to attain Tamakaya in his footsteps. On the banks of Pasi Jaron Canal, there's a temple called Wat Bak Nam Pasi Jaron. In 1916, the position of abbot at the temple had been vacant for many years. His Excellency Somdet Prawanarat of Wat Prachetupon, who was the monastic governor of this district, consecrated Lung Pa Wat Baknam as the new abbot so that he wouldn't have to continue his nomadic existence. Lung Pa Wat Baknam reluctantly accepted the title 
with the intentions of remaining acting abbot for only three months, but eventually his position was made permanent. Taking on the duty of governing Wat Pratnam was a heavy responsibility indeed for the new abbot, because neither the monks nor the devotees accepted him at first. It was only a minority who cooperated. The rest conspired to slander and discredit him. Often they were drunk and disorderly. Sometimes they made attempts on his life, even going as far as to try gunning Lung Pa Wat Bak Nam down in front of his congregation. In spite of his dangers, Lung Pa maintained, We monks must never fight nor run away, but must persevere in our pursuit of good deeds. This is the only way we can win at all times. He had to endure in the face of multitudinous problems and hindrance while at the same time developing the temple in every way by encouraging the monks and novices to study both the scriptures and meditation. The numbers of monks in the monastic community of Wat Baknam gradually increased. Lung Pa Wat Baknam fulfilled his long-standing wish to open a college for scriptural studies and a temple refectory. He supported the spiritual education of monks and lay devotees alike, and gave training in meditation for the congregation on a regular basis. His perseverance in teaching Buddhism, making the knowledge and inspiration to meditate, known in ever-broadening circles of society. Lung Pa Wat Bak Nam meditated consistently and used his knowledge of meditation to lead continually more subtle research into the true nature of life and the world, especially to quench the sufferings of the human condition. He built a special building at his home to his meditation research, calling it the Meditation Workshop. It was designated to be used for meditation research by two teams working in shifts of 24 hours a day. Only those who had attained Tamakaya would be able to help with such research. The reputation of Lung Pa Wat Bak Nam and those doing meditation research spread far and wide in Thailand and abroad. There were even faithful Buddhists who traveled from overseas to ordain as a monk and train themselves at Wat Bak Nam. The first ever foreigner to ordain as a monk in Thailand ordained with Lung Pa at Wat Bak Nam. From the first day Lung Pa Wat Bak Nam became abbot, he had to bear a heavy burden indeed, whether it be the burden of scriptural and meditational education, the spread of knowledge of Tamagaya, repair and expansion of the monastic facilities or pastoral activities for the congregation. Lung Pa Wat Bak Nam rested little. Towards the end of his life, he became fatally ill with hypertension and a hernia. In spite of his illness, he never abandoned his meditation or teaching duties. He exhorted disciples always to continue with their meditations and support of the monastic community. At one time, when he was seriously ill, knowing that he wouldn't live much longer, he confided to his elder sister that he was anxious that there would be no successor to the Tamagaya tradition. It was a few days later that the anxiety disappeared from his face and he mentioned that the reason was that a successor had been born in Singburi province. He ordered Kunyai Chan Kanok Yung, the nun most adept amongst his meditators, to remain at Wak Bak Nam as heir to the Tamakaya traditions, teaching meditation until the successor came to study with her. He added that he would not recover from his illness, that the medicine he took didn't reach the real illness because karma intervened to make it ineffective. Lung Pa Wat Bak Nam knew five years in advance of his impending death, warning his disciples of the fact. He was to pass away peacefully on 3rd February 1959 at Wat Bak Nam Pasi Jaron 
at the age of 74. Even though the light Lung Pa Wat Bak Nam shone forth to the world has now extinguished, but the flames of his teachings burns on in the form of the knowledge of Tamagaya, a legacy of meditation experience which brings insight into the importance in our lives of pursuing perfection and training ourselves to attain Tamagaya. As such knowledge of inner peace spreads out to the world, it continues to make no small contribution to the attainment of true peace in the world. Even to this day, the precious heritage of the knowledge of Tamagaya continues to flourish in all walks of society. Disciples of Lung Pa Wat Bak Nam now practice meditation throughout the world and continue to perpetuate his life's work and mission out of gratitude to he who rediscovered the knowledge of Tamagaya